Okay, so uh, this is a continuation of the previous lecture, and uh, my aim is to uh, explain why the uh, implicit function is function theorem is important, uh, namely that it helps you to uh, think of the zero locus of a function of two complex variables as a Riemann surface. So what I told in the last uh, lecture was what the idea of a Riemann surface is, namely it's uh, it's a uh, you may call it a device or it is a, a, a structure uh, that allows you to do complex analysis on a surface okay a surface that you can for example imagine in three space like the cylinder or the sphere or the torus and uh, the method is that uh, 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 you try to define when a function on at a point of the surface defined on a neighbourhood at a point on the surface is uh, holomorphic or analytic and you do that by composing the function with uh, a coordinate chart at that point and then to make sure that the resulting definition of an analytic function is consistent you only use charts uh, collection of charts which have the property that whenever two charts intersect the corresponding transition function is uh, is is holomorphic uh, <coughs> which uh, will which is equivalent to saying that the transition function is a holomorphic isomorphism okay, it is a holomorphic function which which has an inverse which is also holomorphic okay and uh, the moment you give x your surface x a collection of charts uh, that covers every point and uh, which are pairwise compatible then uh, you make x into a Riemann surface okay and uh, then uh, you can study you can define and study holomorphic functions analytic functions on the Riemann surface and uh, you expect that by studying the properties of analytic functions on the surface uh, you will be able to get uh, some information about the geometry of the surface or you expect the geometry of the surface to be reflected when you study the analytic functions on the surface or the holomorphic functions on the surface. So, uh, uh, of course uh, 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 the application that I have in mind is to look at uh, the uh, the implicit function theorem okay for a function of two variables. So, uh, so let me do that right away application of the implicit function theorem. Suppose uh, f from C two to C uh, is uh, holomorphic. I mean, which is the same as analytic. Uh, in each variable. Okay, what this means is that you write f. Uh, so what it means is that you write f is equal to f of z comma w. Z is the first complex variable. W is the second complex variable, and f is uh, of course uh, uh, you know uh, of course you are assuming f to be continuous, right? And for each fixed value of w uh, the resulting function of z is analytic and for each fixed value of z the resulting function of w is analytic you assume that okay so it is analytic in each separately in each e in each variable right. Uh, and uh, we want to we want to look at look at uh, the the locus f of z comma w equal to 0 in C2 okay. So uh, you are looking at this the points in C2 which are zeros of this function you are looking at the 0 locus of this function okay. Uh, 
so that is it is just uh, f inverse of 0 is the inverse image under f of 0 all those points uh, which go to 0 under f okay. Uh, the first thing that you should realize is that uh, if you think very uh, naively heuristically uh, C2 is 2 dimensions and if you look at the locus f equal to 0 okay you are looking at you are cutting down by one equation so the locus must be one dimension it should be one dimension less from a space of two dimensions uh, you are looking at solutions of one equation so the dimension has to come down by one so the resulting should be one complex dimension okay so it should be uh, a surface so you expect it to be a surface which it is provided f is good enough okay so uh, now what I am going to do is uh, suppose we we look at a we look at a point a point in the locus uh, uh, say is it not comma w not so this is a point uh, where f is 0 okay suppose you are looking at a point like this okay and then uh, what I do is that I look at uh, the conditions that I need to apply the implicit function theorem okay and uh, what does the implicit function theorem say the implicit function theorem says that your uh, uh, function the explicit the, the implicit function can be solved to give an explicit relationship for a variable in terms of uh, the other variable provided the partial derivative with respect to that variable is not 0 okay. So uh, if uh, do f zeta comma eta by do zeta all right at uh, z not comma w not is not 0 suppose this is not 0 all right this means that you know uh, you are looking at f as a function of the first variable keeping the second variable equal to w not okay and then you are taking its derivative and then you are evaluating that derivative at z not okay this is the same as d by d uh, z of f of z comma w not at z equal to z not right and if that is not 0 the implicit function theorem says by the implicit function theorem there exists a delta greater than 0 such that uh, so let me write that down basically it says that since the partial derivative with respect to the first variable is not 0 uh, you can solve for the first variable explicitly as a function of the second variable at that point. So in other words there is a delta greater than 0 such that for all w with mod w minus w not less than delta uh, we get a function z as a function of w satisfying uh, f of uh, z comma w namely f of g w comma w equal to 0 this is what the implicit function theorem says okay this is what the implicit function theorem says. So uh, so you know I am going to draw I am going to draw a schematic graph 
I mean schematic in the sense that I am going to draw a graph uh, which is uh, well mm, uh, which you really cannot draw in 3 space okay uh, but then you will have to uh, imagine it uh, with some imagination so here is C and here is C okay so the each I have drawn only a line okay but I wanted to think of this as C and this also as C alright and then I am I am actually drawing the locus f of z comma w equal to 0 okay so this is C2 this is C2 this is the z coordinate and this is the w coordinate okay this is the C2 plane this is the z coordinate this is a w the w coordinate if you take any point on the plane with uh, uh, it will have two coordinates z0 comma w0 z0 will be the first coordinate which is what you will get when you project under p z projection under the under the first coordinate uh, you will get uh, the first coordinate as z0 and then if you project under the second coordinate uhhh uh, p w you are going to get uh, the second coordinate okay so every point has two coordinates and I am taking a point on the on the z on the locus 0 locus of this uh, of this equation so that means I am I am taking a point such that f of z0 comma w0 is 0 right and now I am looking at uh, now I am uh, assuming that the first partial derivative at z0 comma w0 is not 0 so let us inter interpret this uh, so I think this spelling is wrong it should be th e okay uh, so you know I have a I have a neighborhood of w0 okay so you you must think of this neighborhood of w0 uh, as a disk on the complex plane the w plane centered at w0 radius delta okay so this is this is that neighborhood uh, which is given by mod w minus w0 is less than delta it is actually a disc okay but I cannot show that here right because I am thinking of this as uh, an axis a single line and what is happening is that I have a uh, what does the implicit function theorem say it says that you know I have a function w going to gw so there is a function like this uhhh so there is a function like this which goes from this neighborhood okay such that if I draw the graph of this function the graph of this function will be this locus namely if I take any small w in this neighborhood and I take the point w comma gw then uh, rather gw comma w the way I have written it because w is second variable for me if I take the corresponding point gw comma w that point lies on this locus that is what it means to say f of gw comma w equal to 0 for every w in this neighborhood. So in other words what I am saying is that locally the, the implicit function theorem says that the locus where f vanishes is actually the graph of a function okay it is the graph of the function and now uh, the beautiful thing about uh, a graph is that the, the graph of a function if you project it to the free variable okay that is always a that is always an isomorphism okay. So in other words you know uh, so let me draw this correctly uh, so this is this is a dotted line and uh, this rounded arrow is g uh, which is a map from here to here and of course this is the projection this is p w okay look at uh, uh, look at the set look at the subset 
g w comma w such that w uh, mod w minus w naught is less than delta look at this subset okay actually i am just writing uh, i am just this is just the graph of g okay this is just the graph of g uh, uh, only thing is that uh, uh, normally in the graph you write uh, the variable and then the function but i am writing it the other way i am writing the function and then the variable normally you write the graph of f of x uh, y equal to f of x as x comma fx okay so ideally the graph of g i should write as w comma gw but i am writing as it as gw comma w because of this diagram okay so this subset mind you this is inside this locus f inverse is 0 right because g w comma w satisfies f of z comma w equal to 0 so it is in this locus all right then I want to say that uh, this is the image of this disc uh, under uh, so I just want to say that this is isomorphic to the disc actually because of g so so let me say that I am just using the fact that uh, you know if I if I apply the projection so you know from uh, so I have f inverse 0 that contains this so you know this this subset I am writing here is this this portion of the uh, of the locus which is the which is the graph of g over this uh, disc right except that I have switched the order of the variables right. So this is the set of all so let me rewrite that here g w comma w such that mod w minus w naught less than delta this is a subset of this and now what you do is you apply projection onto w what you will get is the set of all you will get the set mod w minus w naught less than delta because you know if I if I project it under uh, if I project it under p w I will get back my uh, disc and what I want to tell you is that this uh, map I, I claim it is a homeomorphism is a homeomorphism note that this map is a homeomorphism okay I just want to say that whenever you take a graph of whenever you take the graph of a function from the graph to the free variable okay that is always a homeomorphism right. So I just want to say that this p w is uh, uh, is a homeomorphism which means of course this is a projection restricted to this piece of the uh, curve okay I claim it is a homeomorphism to show that I will have to show that this is both injective surjective okay and then I, I have to show it has an inverse all right and what you must understand is that it uh, is it is it is bijective because it has an inverse the inverse is actually g it is just uh, it is given by g namely it is given by w going to g w comma w okay because it has the inverse w going to g w comma w this is just the graph this is just the graph map except that I have written the uh, dependent variable first and then the independent variable normally in the graph you write first the independent variable and then the different dependent variable you write x comma fx for the graph of f okay so I should ideally write w comma gw but does not matter I am writing it as gw comma w okay in this case it is very clear that this is a this is a continuous function okay and because this is the uh, inverse of pw uh, it follows that pw is bijective with this as the inverse and well so the moral of the story is that for the point z0 comma w0 i have found 
uh, you know I have found an open set mind you this is an open set now the reason why this is an open set is because it is homeomorphic to an open set this is an open set on uh, in the complex plane and this is a homeomorphism okay therefore this is also uh, an open set a homeomorphism will always carry open sets to open sets. So what is going to happen is that this uh, this this uh, piece of the graph that I have marked okay is actually an open subset of this this locus okay and it is homeomorphic to this disc okay it is homeomorphic to this disc and it is uh, so it is a disc like neighbourhood of the point z0, w0 what is a disc like neighbourhood it is an open subset which is homeomorphic to a disc. So you see I have this open this this piece of the graph which is an open subset containing the point z0, w0 and that is homeomorphic to the disc under the projection and the you know the moment I have something like this I have a chart because I have identified a point on this locus along with the neighbourhood of that point with a disc okay therefore this gives me a chart so moral of the story is we take we take uh, 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 the pair well uh, g w comma w such that mod w minus w not less than delta comma p w uh, so I will I will use some notation I will use gamma g p w restricted to gamma g I am using gamma g because uh, I mean uh, by capital gamma g the graph of g okay. So capital gamma sub g is the graph of g except that mind you I have uh, switched the order of the variables. So this is the graph so you take this graph along with the projection restricted to the graph that is a chart is is a is a complex coordinate chart at is it not comma w not okay. So uh, so I have so what is the moral of the story the moral of the story is if you look at the locus where uh, f vanishes at a point of that locus where f vanishes if the uh, first partial derivative with respect to uh, I mean if the first partial derivative with respect to the first variable is not 0 then I can get a coordinate chart okay at that point. Now the same argument will tell you that if instead see it may happen that I may not be lucky uh, perhaps uh, the first partial derivative with respect to the first variable might vanish okay but then there is still hope if I have uh, you know uh, that the second I mean the first partial derivative with respect to the second variable does not vanish then again the implicit function theorem will tell you that I can solve for the second variable as a function of the first variable and then what I will get is there also I will get a chart okay. So the moral of the story is throughout this locus at every point where either the first way uh, first partial derivative or the second does not vanish I will always get a chart okay. So you know if I put the condition on this function f the the condition called smoothness which is that there is no point on the locus uh, of zeros of this function where both partial derivatives vanish I mean that is that is a uh, having such a point uh, is very bad it is it is called a singular point it is it is called singular because I cannot apply uh, the inverse the implicit function theorem to apply the implicit function theorem I should have at least one of the partial derivatives non vanish if both partial derivatives vanish that is a singular point and I do not want to consider functions which uh, whose 0 loci have singular points does not vanish. So you know if I am working with a smooth function okay namely a function such that there is no point on the 0 locus of the function for which both partial derivatives vanish then at every point 
I will get a chart because of the implicit function theorem. The chart may be projection on to the second coordinate if the first partial derivative does not vanish and it will be a projection on to the first coordinate if the second does not vanish ok. So I, I can cover it by charts now the beautiful thing is <coughs> these charts are automatically compatible ok these charts are automatically compatible and therefore they make this locus into a Riemann surface that is a beautiful thing. So the moral of the story is if you are looking at a smooth function ok of 2 variables ok then it is automatically a Riemann surface it is a Riemann surface which is sitting inside C2 it is a Riemann surface which is uh, embedded inside C2 ok. So uh, so let me also write let me write that down so you know the uh, so this is the importance of the implicit function theorem I can uh, uh, when I am studying 0 locus uh, the 0 locus of a function of 2 variables uh, if it is uh, smooth function I am already looking at a Riemann surface ok I am already looking at a Riemann surface there are some technicalities which I will try to explain uh, very soon but uh, let me uh, let me uh, let me say the following thing suppose uh, we had uh, a point uh, z1 comma w1 uh, in f inverse 0 that is f of z1 comma w1 is equal to 0 with uh, do f uh, sorry do f zeta eta by do eta at uh, z1 comma w1 not equal to 0 okay so i am i am i am considering another point uh, where uh, the uh, you know this first partial derivative with respect to the second variable does not vanish and uh, that point is on again on this locus the 0 locus of the function ok. So, so the, the so if I draw another diagram it should look like this so here is my complex plane this is the z coordinate this is another complex plane this is the w coordinate and here is my locus this is f of z comma w equal to 0 which is otherwise f inverse of 0 and of course all this is happening in C2 the, the whole space is C2 that is where every, everything is happening C cross C ok and uh, now I am having a point uh, z1 comma w1 alright if I use projection onto z I get the point z1 if I use projection onto w I get the point w1 ok and I have assumed that the uh, partial derivative with respect to the second variable does not vanish ok at that point. Now again uh, the implicit function theorem by the implicit function theorem function theorem. theorem there exists lambda greater than 0 such that for uh, z with mod z minus z1 lesser than lambda ok we have we get a function uh, of z uh, we, we we get a function omega in terms of z uh, omega is equal to h of z ok such that such that uh, f of z comma h of z equal to 0 ok that is in other words uh, you are just saying that if the uh, the implicit function theorem just says that you know if the 
if the partial derivative with respect to the to a particular variable is not 0 then you can solve for that variable as a function of the other variable. So the first partial the partial derivative with respect to the second variable uh, uh, w is not 0 so I can solve for w which is the second variable with respect to which the partial derivative is not 0 in terms of the other variables is the first variable okay so I can get a function w is equal to h of z for z uh, in a neighborhood of z1 okay which satisfies this uh, equation so I get an explicit solution to this implicit equation okay. Now uh, what does it mean if you if you draw a diagram similar to that now I will get a I will get an I will get the neighborhood here I will get this neighborhood here this neighborhood neighborhood here will be mod z minus z1 less than lambda okay I will get a neighborhood uh, uh, namely a disc in the complex plane the z plane centered at z1 radius lambda and I will get a function of z I uh, so I will get a I will get a h I will get a function h like this okay and if you draw the graph of that h I am going to get this piece of the graph okay so I am going to just get this piece of the graph okay so again what will happen is that we will have again you will have that the set of all the points in the graph of h gamma h the set of all points z comma h of z uh, such that uh, mod z minus z1 less than lambda uh, this will be this will be a subset of the zero locus and if you uh, if you take projection to the free variable z okay uh, onto this neighborhood uh, at uh, this disc center uh, this is this surrounding z1 radius lambda uh, is a homeomorphism this will be a homeomorphism because uh, we it will have inverse uh, 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 is it going to uh, is it comma h of z okay so it will be homeomorphism so what this tells you is that I get this uh, so in this case I get this graph of uh, so this this uh, this piece of the of this uh, locus is actually graph of h it is the graph of h and that is an open subset it is an open neighborhood of the point z1 comma w and because it is homeomorphic to an open set in the uh, so it is a disc like neighborhood and uh, the homeomorphism is given by the projection onto z restricted to that open set all right so that is a chart so I get a chart at the point z1 comma w okay so uh, we can take uh, gamma h comma p z restricted to gamma h uh, as a chart uh, at z1 comma w1 okay so uh, in this case uh, this is the ga this is the graph of g okay you got a function g from the w from a disc on the w plane and this is this becomes graph of g this is what happens if the partial derivative with respect to z does not vanish and if the partial derivative with respect to w if it does not vanish then this piece of this locus will become the graph of h where h is a function from uh, a neighborhood of uh, uh, the, the point where with the first coordinate right and so in any case uh, if the cur if the if your if your if your uh, uh, curve is smooth okay namely if the function f is smooth then you get you automatically you get charts like this and all the charts come because of the implicit function theorem okay so if f is smooth uh, that is for every point 
in f inverse 0 either dou f by dou zeta or dou f by dou eta does not vanish. Then f inverse 0 has a collection of charts. because of the implicit function theorem because of the implicit function theorem okay and now the natural question you will ask is that uh, well does this collection of charts which come naturally because of the implicit function theorem does it make it into a Riemann surface and what is it that you have to check to say that may it makes it into a Riemann surface you have to only check compatibility okay and uh, I, I all I want to tell you is that the compatibility is trivial okay what is the compatibility the compatibility is that the transition function should be holomorphic okay if you take a point uh, if you take two uh, nearby points whose charts are in this direction okay okay then the transition function will go like this and come back okay and that will be identity map on w which is of course holomorphic okay. So if you have two charts of this type which overlap then the identity function the then the transition function is just w going to w which is of course holomorphic as a function of w. Similarly if you have two charts of this type then the transition function is z going to z that is the identity function here that is of course holomorphic so you get compatibility the only thing you have to case check is you if you have a chart in this direction intersecting with a chart in this direction okay and if you have a chart in this direction intersecting with a chart in this direction you know if you go like this what you will get is z will go to uh, uh, you see if you if you go like this okay you will either get uh, g or h okay which are both analytic so then also the transition functions will become holomorphic so for example you know if a chart like this overlapped with a chart like that okay and if i took the transition function like this then i'm first going by uh, so i'm going z to z comma h of z okay and then if i project onto w i will get h of z so the transition for function will become h and h is of course holomorphic why is h holomorphic because uh, uh, that is because of the implicit function theorem. Similarly if I go uh, if I take the other transition function namely if I go like this and then come down via that then it will be w going to g w comma w and then if I take first projection I will get g w so it will be w going to g w which is simply the function g and g is also holomorphic again because of the implicit function theorem therefore you see automatically all charts are compatible all the charts are automatically compatible just because of the implicit function theorem. So automatically this becomes a Riemann surface okay it automatically becomes a Riemann surface that is the beautiful thing so so let me write that uh, it is it is it is clear it is clear that that the transition functions functions are uh, either identity on z or identity function on w or g or h which are all holomorphic. The transition functions are of course holomorphic because identity function identity functions are holomorphic and the g and the h that you get they are functions that you have gotten by the implicit function theorem they are holomorphic okay. So the moral of the story is that uh, uh, f of 
z comma w if f is a smooth function f of z comma w becomes a Riemann surface okay so let me write that thus if f is a smooth function namely that either the first or the second or either the, either the partial derivative with respect to the first variable or the partial derivative with respect with respect to the second variable does not vanish at each point uh, uh, where f is 0 okay then uh, f inverse 0 in C2 automatically becomes a Riemann surface this automatically becomes a Riemann surface okay. So now what I am going to do is I am going to tell you a little bit of technicality okay so uh, so this is uh, uh, of course I have conveyed the main point that uh, one very important application of implicit function theorem is that you can look at the zero locus of a smooth function as a Riemann surface okay so you can look you can do complex analysis on this surface very naturally all right so uh, the technical point is the following see when we define a Riemann surface if you want to give an abstract definition of a Riemann surface you have to first define what an abstract surface is okay so the definition so let me quickly recall these facts which you can uh, try to understand uh, if you do a little bit more re of reading so what you need is basically you start with a topological space x okay which is Hausdorff okay and which is second countable okay namely you assume that it has a countable uh, 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 you know it has a countable basis okay. So you start with the topological space which is Hausdorff and which is second countable alright and which locally looks like the plane alright the complex plane or the real two plane such a such a uh, topological space is called a surface it is called a real surface okay. So you know the sphere the torus the cylinder they are all real surfaces okay and uh, we also put the extra condition that uh, you work only with connected topological spaces okay. So uh, I when I defined Riemann surface here I told you a Riemann surface is a surface x with a complex atlas namely with a collection of compatible charts but I did not tell you what that x is I told you for example x could be uh, you know you can think of x as the sphere or the torus or the cylinder but in general what can x be the answer to that is x should be a topological space which is connected which is Hausdorff which is second countable and which locally looks like looks like the plane the fact that it locally looks like the plane is what tells you that every point of x has a neighborhood which looks like a disc okay and that is the only uh, uh, way of saying that it is a surface a surface is something that should locally look like the plane okay. So this is a technical definition and the point I want to make is that if I want to really with respect to that definition if I want to say that this 0 locus is a is a, a Riemann surface I will have to verify that this is Hausdorff I have to verify this is connected I have to verify this is second quantum okay and the truth is that uh, I mean the Hausdorffness and the second countableness are not so difficult uh, to verify okay uh, the slightly more technical thing is the connectedness okay to say that uh, uh, for example if you take a polynomial uh, if f of z comma w the simplest kind of function on in two variables that you can think of as a polynomial in two variables okay and if you want to ensure that the zero locus of that polynomial is connected that is this graph that I have drawn here is actually a connected set in C2 one nice condition is that the polynomial should be irreducible that is the polynomial cannot be factored into a product of two different polynomials two non-constant polynomials okay. 
So, the the proof of this fact is not so easy, but you can take it uh, as a statement as a theorem that if f of z comma w is a polynomial which is irreducible then the 0 locus of f is actually connected okay. So, you get connectedness you and I told you that it that it is uh, Hausdorff and uh, second countable is something that you can verify okay because that is already there for C2 C2 is of of course Hausdorff C2 is of course second countable alright it's a Euclidean space. So uh, the moral of the story is that uh, in the with this formal definition of a Riemann surface also if you take for f an irreducible polynomial in two variables which is smooth then the 0 locus will be actually a Riemann surface okay and uh, uh, so this tells you that uh, uh, the formal side of the picture is also correct okay if you want to think of Riemann surfaces the formal sense as Hausdorff second countable connected topological spaces endowed with a complex atlas this locus is automatically one such Riemann surface okay and all this is uh, 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 just a beautiful corollary of the implicit function theorem okay. So I will stop here.